So Exodus chapter 17, where we're on today, and the title for today's message is A Little Help from My Friends. And I'm sure as we consider that, we need people round about us to help us and support us and to guide us and to hold us up. And that's what we're looking at today. So just as we open up, a wee bit of a, a change from usual, a wee bit of trivia, a few wee questions for you this morning. It's like a wee bit of a, a general knowledge quiz. So I'm going to go with some song lyrics and you can fill in the blanks or can I continue on the song lyric. It's a TV, TV theme tune, but it's quite an old one, okay, but I'm sure like, you'll manage. <laughs> Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Can you think of what that sitcom was? I, I, no, I would empty the room. Okay, no ideas. See, it's one that I've watched all the time. Cheers. Sometimes, I'll continue on for this. Sometimes you want to go, but everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everyone knows your name. So the song speaks of the needs and the want for community to be together, for people to know you and for you to know people. So that's what I'm kind of looking at here. Another one, you'll get this one. So no one's told your life is going to be this way. Your job's a joke, you're broke, your love life's DOA. Friends, okay. And the catchy bit that I want to go to is, I'll be there for you when the rain starts to pour. I'll be there for you like you've been there before. I'll be there because you're there for me too. So that concept of having people round about us to help us and support us and guide us, we receive it and then we give it back as well. Last one, last one. Song works this time. Again, it was a TV theme tune as well. I don't know if you'd know the, the show. What would you think if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out of me, on me? Lend me your ears and I'll sing you a song. I'll try not to sing out of key. Next line is, I'll get by with a little help from my friends. So it was Joe Cocker, formerly the Beatles, and it was The Wonder Years was a kind of TV show as well that I watched in my youth. So again, the concept of friends, having people round about us, and having help from those round about us as well. And that's the concept we consider from today's text. So today we're in Exodus 17 from verse 8 to 16. And there's a background Israel, they've left their bondage in Egypt. The ten plagues had been behind them. The Israelites had passed through the Red Sea, been led by a pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, protected for, provided for, all the way along the journey that they'd went through. God had been with them and had led them. And we find them now at this point in Exodus, they're camped out in a place called Rephidim. Verse 8 says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So we see an appearance of somebody here, and that person that's appeared is the enemy. The enemy has appeared when they are in this place called Rephidim. The enemy being this people group called the Amalekites. So the Amalekites had attacked Israel, an unexpected and unprovoked attack. And if you look and we know our Bible, we might know that the Amalekites, that Amalek was Esau's grandson. We see that from Genesis chapter 36. Esau was one of Isaac and Rebekah's sons. So I kind of, the point we're trying to make, they're distant relatives from the Israelites, so they've been attacked by distant relatives of their own people. But these Amalekites, they were quite a dirty bunch. They were a kind of fierce desert tribe, if you want to put it that way. And they lived in and around the land of Moab. And they were unhappy with anyone going anywhere near their territory, territory, anywhere near their land. And these people, they didn't particularly grow their own crops, have their own livestock. They lived by plundering and pillaging off of other people. They attacked and took off of others. And that's how they survived and made their living. So unsurprisingly, when Israel came close to them, they were not hospitable. They came on attack against Israel, and they became one of Israel's enemies. And it's a clash between the Israelites and the Amalekites that we see right throughout the Bible. It was this kind of clash that we see that lasted for generations. So thinking of the attack itself that we see in Exodus 17, it took place at Rephidim. And this was the last kind of stopping place of the Israelites on their exodus from um, from Egypt before they reached Mount Sinai. So this is the last 
to this stopping place that they came to. So it was a stopping place. What did you do in a stopping place? Stop. <laughs> yeah. That was an easy question, you got that one. So you stop in a stopping place. You need a stopping place because you need rest. You're tired, you need to sit down, you need a break. Give me a break. No, we've been wandering for so long here. And what we see here is a bit of a spiritual principle that the enemy will attack us when we are weak, when we're vulnerable, and when we rest and we're not vigilant to the things around about us. The Amalekites, who are they attacking? They're not attacking this strong, armoured, big group of people. You know, with spears and lots of armour and all the kind of armoury round about them. Essentially, it's a wandering, vagabond people group. These Israelites, they're not highly armoured, they're not highly skilled, they've not got lots of kind of protection round about them. A vagabond camp of all ages, a tired people to a degree, who've stopped here at this place. The people had lived in slavery and captivity for a long time. They certainly weren't battle tested, they're not kind of fierce soldiers with years of experience behind them. And as I said, they're not armoured with lots of weapons either. So we read a wee bit of insight from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 25, verse 17 to 18, on how the Amel, Amel, put my teeth in, Amalekites attacked the camp of Israel. Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 18. And it says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you in the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Their tools, pick off the weak people. Whoever's at the back, whoever's struggling, will target them first of all. The stragglers, the weak ones, that was a target for this group of people. So who would these people be? More than likely, the elderly. And then the opposite stage, the young people. Nursing mothers, perhaps even those pregnant. So those that, it was a bigger struggle to make that long journey, that exodus out of Egypt. So again, the enemy will often attack us, more than often, at our weakest spot. A place of weakness, a place of vulnerability in our own lives. So we've got to consider that and make sure that we are aware of the places that we are vulnerable and we've got our spiritual armour up and we've got other people around about us to aid us in that as well. But note the location also, verse 8. Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So that name, Rephidim, means rests or stays or resting places, which we kind of covered a wee moment ago. Some people think it was maybe the kind of only kind of desert oasis in that region at the time where nomads and the herders would automatically go, they know they would have water there, they could get kind of some sustenance at that place. But the point being, it's the place of rest, at their place of rest, that the battle came upon them. Our enemy, the enemy that's kind of warned against our spiritual walk, against our souls, our enemy will attack us in our resting places as well when we're least expecting it, just like the Israelites here. That's why we're told that we've got an enemy, a roaring lion out there that's always, always seeking to devour us. We need to be vigilant to that, to have our eyes aware, to have our spiritual armour on, and to know the wiles of the enemy that comes against us. It may attack you in your family, your children, your spouse, your job, your health. Just when you're wandering along, my life's going okay. <laughs> Bam, something hits in at that point. Probably when a bit of complacency creeps in and you're not being vigilant to walking close to the Lord and looking for the attacks of the enemy round about us. When your spiritual armour is neglected, your helmet of salvation sitting to the side of your belt, the truth is half hanging off, and you're going about your Christian life without the vigour and the attention that you should have. We can all let that happen at some point, and we all do let that happen at some point. We're kidding ourselves if we think we don't do that. But the point is, we need to be aware of that possibility. We can even think of the book of Judges, when all was going well, in the book of Judges with the people, when all was going well, they became complacent, they fell into sin, and then God's judgment was there hanging over the top of them. But when things went to pot, they cried out to the Lord. That's why at all times we need to be in the game, so to speak. We need to be vigilant. 
coming to and before the Lord at all times. Good times, bad times, and in-between times, we're vigilant at all these times as well. And the truth of the matter is, as a believer, as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, you don't really have any rest as such. Obviously, we get the scripture where we'll be resting the Lord and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But it doesn't mean that we can step back and go, okay, God, I'm doing nothing. Over to you. We individually have got responsibility to be vigilant, to stick close to God and to abide in him. And when we do, you know, his protection, his guidance, and all these other things come upon us. But we're always at war because our enemy never stops. So we need to be vigilant in that regard. We need to be ready to fight the enemy wherever and whenever in our lives. So we read in the situation here of Moses. Moses, the leader at this point, and he has to direct this situation as this enemy comes and attacks the Israelite people that he's leading. And what he does, he instructs Joshua to lead some men into battle. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur watch from a nearby hill. Verse 9. Moses said to Joshua, Come, choose us some men to go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will go and stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So Moses doesn't just kind of see this situation unfold and go, oh, I wonder what I'm going to do and stand back and do nothing. He's moved to action. He sees Joshua, recognises Joshua's skills and all the rest of it, and says to Joshua to get men and to go and fight against this enemy. And that Moses, he would go up to the hill to be both visible to the fighters and also to have a good view of all the battle was going to survey the full situation that was taking place. Moses is the leader, the overseer of the group. So he had to be on top of the events to see everything that was going on. So that was why he went to this high vantage point to see the battle round about him. He needed to see it all, to take it in, to process it, bring it before God and strategize with the Lord's enabling what to do in that situation and to make the correct decisions. Remember the Israelite people here, had they been cared for up until this point? Looked after, protected? My answer to that is yes. God had provided to them quail, the Red Sea power, and all these kind of miraculous things that the people had seen. But now the people had to engage in this situation here. They couldn't just stand back and wait for God to do everything for them. They had to practically step into action. The Lord was going to fight for them. The Lord was going to give them a victory. But Joshua had to get soldiers ready and prepared, and they had to fight in this battle. Maybe bring our own thoughts back to ourselves. Well, I'm a Christian. I just want a nice, easy life. You know, I thought it would be blessings and sunshines and rainbows since I gave my heart to God and became born again. I didn't sign up for this difficult stuff. Well, unfortunately, Christian life involves spiritual warfare. You know, your life's not difficult all the time, but at certain points there's things that go on. In the age, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers. We need to accept that, realise that, and engage in that battle, because God gives us the tools and the ability to do it in his strength and not in our own. But you and I need to fight. God asks us to do things in those situations there. So Israel is threatened with destruction. And for the victory to be achieved, the Lord is seeking their involvement. We say it often that we are vessels for the Lord's use. They were vessels for the Lord's use in this situation here. Their purpose, their use, was to fight against the enemy. So we see, I suppose, two things in this account here. Godly leadership and intercessory prayer at the top of the hill by Moses. So godly leadership by Moses and that intercessory prayer. He's on top of the hill, seeing it all, surveying it all, and bringing it all before God. And the second thing, active participation in the battle by Joshua and the troops engaging in the spiritual warfare really that we're seeing um, in this situation so we see all people have a stake all people have a part to play in the situation here a combination of god the divine 
and human input. And both when they came together would give the victory. And that was God's plan for them here with this enemy's attack. And if they failed to do their part, then the cause could have or perhaps would have been lost because they wouldn't have been obedient to the Lord's call and enabling in this situation. So let's consider Moses, the leader of the group here, spiritually as well as practically in this account. He strategized the battle plan. He gave them, you know, they go ahead to go and do what they're going to do when the attack came. But importantly, it was that intercessor and the mediator for the people as well. And as Moses raised up his, his rod, that was that kind of picture of intercession and prayer to lift up the mantle that God had given him. James 5, chapter James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And that's what we're seeing played out here. As Moses stood up there and prayed for the people, they would see that that was really important in the situation. And perhaps without his leadership, without his intercession, perhaps the Israelites would never have made it as far as they did. They might not even have got to Rephidim at this point here without Moses following the leading of God. But Moses had the rod, the staff in his hands, and that was a symbol of authority, of God's presence and authority with Moses, representing the power and the presence of God with the people and with Moses individually as well. As Moses raised up the rod, the people would recognise this is the man of God, this is the leader here. And there would be an encouragement to the fighters. Moses is with us, God is with us. Go in God's strength, go in God's power. And any time that they looked up to the hill, they could see Moses. No matter where they were in the battle plane, they could see Moses at all points. And he was their encouragement. He was there to intercede for them, to strategize for them, and to call on God's presence in that battle amongst them as well. How many times in your own life you go through a difficult situation? You're feeling dead weepy, but you're holding it back. But then you come across like... We've got those one or two people that when you see them, you just go, <laughs> because you've got that kind of connection. The people didn't do that with Moses, but they looked at Moses and they seen Moses and they went, yes, that's Moses, my encourager, my strength. God is with him, God is with us. And he encouraged them in the battle that they were facing here. He was encouragement to the fighters, contributed towards their morale and their effectiveness as they fought really on behalf of the Lord in this situation there. And Moses continually prayed up in that hill and brought it all before God. Let's look to a different person. Let's look to Joshua. We see Joshua for the first time in Scripture here in Exodus. And Joshua was ordered to go and to pick men out for that fight, for this battle here. And we see that Joshua was, first of all, obedient to the leader and authority over him. He did as he was asked. And with willingness and courage, he went out with people, chose his warriors, and went and fought in the battle there. We scripture in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What we're seeing here is obviously it's a physical battle that's going on, but it's spiritual tools that are really important in this situation. All the spiritual tools that Moses and the people were employing by interceding, by bringing the authority and the presence of God to the situation. Physical problems also require to be fought in the heavenly places as well. And we need to remember that as believers, to go to the heavenly realm as well, to look to our Father, to look to the spiritual tools that God has employed to us. And Moses battled in prayer at the top of that hill. As he looked down the men in the valley below as they fought against the enemy, he prayed and intercessed constantly for them with all his might, with all his power, with all his strength, asking God into that situation. And it says in verse 11, And so it was, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now we need to be quite careful with this and thinking, okay, this is a wee, magic, a wee magic sword that he's got here. It's not quite the case there, but it's a principle that we're seeing. 
The staff in the hand of Moses didn't instantly or miraculously gain the victory. It was a combination of things in the mix here. But again, as Moses is in that strong position, the people looked to him, they could see the victories he had the strength, the power, the encouragement of Moses. But maybe as they looked at Moses and seen Moses becoming weak, the people maybe faltered their self. He's struggling maybe, but maybe I'm feeling tired, maybe I can't do this. And I think a lot of times, sometimes in our own life, we can go through those situations as well. Unfortunately, in Christian circles, what we see these days is so many leaders falling into sin and disgracing themselves, going out to ministry, and we think, well, if they can't do it, I mean, how, how am I going to do it? So we can take things that way, but even within our fellowship, when things go wrong, maybe see people doing things that we think, I never thought they would go, go and do that. If they can't stick to the faith and stick to the scriptures, and I wonder if I'll be able to in the longevity of my life. And maybe we can become kind of faltering ever so slightly. But what we do see here is when Moses holds up his arms and the staff, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites took the battle. So it was that kind of to and fro that was going on. The battle, as we look into it, was a long one. It wasn't just half an hour, an hour, a couple of hours. It was multiple hours that they were at it in this battle here. So Moses, he's a man. He's human. Try holding your hand up and see how long you can do it for on your own. He became tired. He became weary. Bear in mind, it wasn't just the act of holding up the staff in his hand. He's overseeing the battle, he's praying, he's interceding, he's strategizing, and bringing it all before God. The great Moses became tired. And if he can become tired, guess what? So can we as well. And we take it, appreciate that and accept that in our own lives. The weight of leadership, the pressure of interceding for the people brought its weight upon Moses and he was starting to faint. I'm sure he wanted to be strong, but Mark 14, verse 38, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's us at some point, isn't it? So it says in verse 12, but Moses' hands became weary, heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So fortunately, Moses wasn't alone. Now there is a very important point there. Along with Moses on the top of the hill are Aaron and her. The burdens were more than he could carry alone. So the Lord had men come round about him to help support him. To help him at his point of weakness. And we need to have people round about us to help us, to hold us accountable, particularly when we are at a weak point in our lives as well. Now, can you point out the scripture verse that says, Moses asked for help? Have a wee search. Isn't he there? Talking to them, well, we're not asking for my help. I'm not going to step in. Oh, I don't want to overstep the mark. And we go through these kind of things in our mind. And they're quite good. We don't want to kind of bring in there without any kind of proper processing of things. But the people saw a need, and they went and met the need in Moses' life. And Moses was open to receive the help as well and to receive assistance. They gave him a rock for him to sit on. So they gave him what? What's a rock? What purpose does it serve here? A solid, secure, sure foundation underneath him when he was starting to fall and grow weak. If we're falling, would we like somebody to come under us and say, here's a solid, secure foundation. I'm not going to let you fall. We've got this. We've got you. We will not let this happen. We kind of need to do that for each other, to recognise the needs of other people. First and foremost, to point them to the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ, first and foremost, because he is the rock underneath our feet, our sure, firm and sure foundation that means that we won't fall. So first and foremost, that's where we point people. Then we see what we can do in their situation to help as well, to encourage, strengthen and support them. And again, it's all these weak and weary times that the enemy will come and attack us at our weak points, try and pick us off. We are struggling at the end. You're the target. You get that bullet mark on your back that the enemy is after you. And we need to help those that are weak within our fellowship, within our own circles as well. 
So Moses had these two men around him. They help. They're not glory hunting. They're not after titles or recognition or gold stars or badges. They just want to help somebody in need. And again, I suppose that's what we need to do as well. Help for helping sake. Tell them just to go and help somebody then and just step away and go and do what else you're doing. They were not looking for anything out of it. We are just helping somebody at their point of need. Being the hands and the feet of Jesus to encourage and support them. Simply doing it in our service for God. So the success of this battle depended largely on Moses. His strength, he's holding up the staff. And when he, man he managed to do that task simply because of Aaron and her and his situation as well. So we really shouldn't underestimate the value of supporting and holding up other people. Interceding for them and prayer in the spiritual, also helping in the practical aspects as well. Without help, without support, things can and do fail to reach their full potential and may eventually fall apart. The Christian life's not about I, it's about we. It's us together. You know, it's a collective thing. And our success in many ways is dependent on our, the support of other people. Nobody else can walk your walk, but we can help each other and support each other and encourage each other in our walk with God. Sometimes it might be kind words and support and encouragement. Other times it might be a swift kick up the backside when you're going down the wrong path. What are you doing? You know, come, it's this way you should be going. You're going the wrong way. We should be open the same way as Moses was open to allow people to input into our lives. And we just simply see the power of pulling together. Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be outpowered by another, two can withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know, that's the kind of concept that we're seeing here. We want to be strong cords, not easily frayed and broken by attacks or life's pressures. We can help to bind around each other, hopefully, in that regard. So we see the need for community. And I put a week the thing in our flyer today as well. This concept of we need circles, not just rows. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're sitting in rows just now. And it's good to be here and to be in fellowship, to listen to teaching and all those things. A wee cup of tea and a wee bit of a chat. But that only goes so far. That's where your kind of small groups and your kind of your fellowship and your deliberate attempts to meet up with other believers, to chew over some of the word, to have spiritual conversations, to help people in their daily lives really matters. You know, we go to the, the New Testament church, what did they do? You know, they fellowship, they broke bread together, they supported and encouraged each other in all things. They didn't just show up once a week and then that was it. You know, it was this kind of continual thing. We need circles, we need communities of groups together where we can batter off each other with what did that mean? How do I apply that in life? I've not got a clue. What do you do? And we can really glean from each other. It's just that Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so one another sharpens another. That's what we're really talking about here. I've really been quite encouraged when we started our today. Coffee cake and conversation Wednesday once a month, but we moved our prayer meeting to an online with that kind of, it was a Bible study, but it was more chatty, you know, what do you think, what can you input, and it was quite conversational. And I think simply just the people turning up and kind of fairly decent numbers had an interest in it, and that continued. And it simply just shows that there's a desire and a need for these types of things to talk to each other rather than me just talking to you just now. Obviously, we need this as well, but it's the kind of conversational things that really sometimes hit home and really help us to work out our Christian walk. So there's many, many times in the Bible it speaks of each other or one another. It's not just you know, us individually. First Thessalonians 4.18, therefore encourage one another with these words. Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in love. Hold one another above yourselves. Galatians 6 to carry each other's burdens. You know, that's a kind of multiple thing there. James 5, 6, and confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. If I don't know you that well, I'm not telling you all the bad things I'm doing. But you build up that kind of connection when you're in fellowship and small groups and you build up trust and things over 
a period of time. And there's many, many other scriptures that talk about that kind of one another aspect. And that's important. Relational connection. Well, so it's first and foremost with the Lord, but then it's outworked with each other as well. So as we get back to our Exodus 17 text, as I come to wrap this up, sometimes we might feel weary, burdened, our arms are weak. One of my favourite verses is Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. As we support each other, we need to remember more importantly that the Lord always supports us. And we remember how Jesus had his arms lifted up, nailed to the cross for our salvation, to win the victory over sin and death in the cross for us. Sin, death and death might be raised up as well. We can rest in those truths and encourage each other with those truths and that the Lord will never leave us or forsake us, that he will strengthen us in our points of need. So what do we do here from this account of Moses, Aaron and her? Well, first and foremost, as a believer, as a disciple, we need to have our hands lifted up in prayer to God. If there's no prayer, can you really expect a victory to come? And if our hands fall down, if we drop our spiritual guards, there may be a consequence as we leave that gate open for the enemy to come in and to attack us. The second is a believer, a disciple needs help from each other sometimes to keep our hands lifted up. We need help from each other. As Joe Cocker would say, we need a little help from our friends. Moses was doing a hard job. The Christian walk isn't easy. It can become difficult. And in these times, we need somebody to say, God's with you. God will not forsake you. God's hand is upon you. We need those encouraging words. We need to be an Aaron or a her to intercede, to declare God's victory over ourselves and other people. His presence in us, with us, and over us, and for us also. So what happened, verse 13, Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Victory came in that situation because of what was at work at that point. Success comes when we labour together in prayer, together in prayer and action. Defeat came by the sword, by the physical, by the battles of the men, but the sword was made effective by prayer of Moses and the guys on top of the hill. And we need to keep that always at the forefront of our mind, the spiritual and the practical together is what is needed. Israel didn't fight its battles alone. The God of Israel was always there, but he was working through the vessels on that battleground and the vessels on top of the hill to bring the victory. The Lord was with them. Verse 15, it's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. And that banner is over us as well, if we know Jesus is our Lord and Saviour. That he is our identity and he is flying over the top of our lives. So you'll go to your battles, but look to God for the victory. Bring all things to him in prayer. But act in the situation. Physically put on your spiritual armour and look to people around about you to support you in that end as well. So life of discipleship may be filled with some challenges and there will always be spiritual warfare of some description. Be vigilant. Look out for these things and trust in the Lord at all times. Psalm 34 once says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let's try and do the same. Engage in the battle. Realise you need each other. We need circles, not just rows. And we need the Lord if we're going to be victorious. Who are you supporting? And who's supporting you? And do you trust God in all these things as well? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this account here in Exodus. As we look to Moses, Aaron and her in this battle that we see acted out. Help us, Lord, to remember that the, in the believer's life that ultimately we are upheld by you. We look to you, Lord Jesus, for our strength, for our support. 
Do you, Lord, uphold us with your righteous right hand. We give you thanks, Lord, that we are your friend, that you care for us, you, you look to us, Lord, you oversee our lives. That we, Lord, need to look to you for input in every sphere of our lives. And we give you thanks, Lord, for fellow brothers and sisters round about us that can help us when our arms grow weak, can put a seat underneath us, Lord, when we need to sit down, when we, when we faint, Lord, when we fail, when we struggle through our daily lives. But we give you thanks at all points that you, Lord, are on our side. And if you're on our side, Lord, who can come against us? So, Heavenly Father, just be with us here today, Lord, and be with us now as we just end in a wee bit of praise and worship, Father. Just be with us, Lord, and encourage our hearts here today. Help us, Lord, to look out for our own weaknesses, but also look out for other people, how we can help and support them as well, Father. So we just bring these things before you, Lord, and ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.